I think as we look at this study today on Colossians, we're going to see um, from the application point of view that it's all about Christ. <laughs> and isn't that wonderful that we can focus on Christ and just learn about him and lift him up, you know, in our lives? So that's basically what we're going to talk about. There are some other points that we'll make. But we're going to get a lot of uh, information today about, about Christ. And uh, I, wanted to, I want to begin, as we look at the, uh, this epistle, I want to begin with this map. And of course, all of, all of you can see it, uh, hopefully. And you can see the uh, church that we're, we're looking at, Colossae. Um, and then right above that, you can see uh, Laodicea. Uh, right above that, you can see Hierapolis. Uh, yeah, you can see it even better than I can see it on my screen. <laughs> so that's great. It's showing up better for you than it is on this little monitor that I have here. Um, so I don't need to point anything out. I mean, just you see Ephesus. You see Laodicea. You see Colossae. And then right above that, you see Hierapolis. That was a congregation as well. Let's go back to the map for a minute. Uh, did I change it myself? I may have. Let me go back. Uh, okay, here we go. So um, it gives you a, a good picture of uh, what we're going to be looking at today. And uh, you see some other cities up there as well, other Congregation, Ephesus, Myrna. Um, and then, of course, you see uh, Tarsus way over here to the right. Now, why is, can you tell me why Tarsus is up there? Why is that significant? Um, if you remember, anybody wants to tell me before I respond to it? What? That's where Paul is from. At the time, he's Saul, okay? And that's where he's from. Um, we see also down near the bottom there, you see this little place by the name of uh, Cyprus. Does that ring a bell with you that we've talked about when we were looking at the life of Christ? Does that ring a bell with anybody? Who is from Cyprus? He's also included in this lesson today. Barnabas. Thank you, Ron. Barnabas. So, uh, very interesting uh, map as we, as we start today and look at our lesson. So, let's get started. Major lessons from Colossians. Um, we start with the introduction. Uh, it's from my lesson here. It says, if Ephesians can be labeled the epistle portraying the church of Christ, then Colossians must surely be Christ of the church. Ephesians focuses on the body. Colossians, Colossians focuses on the head. The book of Colossians may be divided into two broad sections. The first portion, doctrinal, chapters 1 and 2. And then, of course, the second portion, practical, three and four, and we'll talk about a lot of that today. Um, and then we get to Paul's purpose. The purpose in writing this epistle is to show that Christ is preeminent, first and foremost in everything, and that the Christian life must, be reflect, must reflect that priority. Also, a second reason was to confirm, confront false doctrine that were threatening the church in Colossae. So really to emphasize Christ, that was, that's what we want to do, and then also to confront false doctrine. And Michael and Ron have already talked about that, the heresy that existed at that time, and we'll talk about it just a little bit also. The life of Christians, 
The lives of Christians ought to be rooted in Christ, alive in Him, hidden in Him, complete in Him. It is inconsistent for Christians to live without Christ. Our lives must be clothed in Christ's love with his peace ruling in our hearts. Christians must be equipped to make Christ first in every area of their lives. What would our lives be without Christ? Just, just imagine what life would be without Christ what life would be without God if we lived in a city, a place where we had no Christians. Certainly there would be no life from the standpoint of Christians. Um, but just, just think about that as we look, at our, look into our lesson today. And then, of course, when you look at this study, Paul had some greetings. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. He gave thanks to the Father and, and Christ because of their faith and their love for the saints in the church. Identifies the Christians here as saints. You know, we need to realize we are saints. We're Christians. Um, and then, what it means to be in cross. To be delivered from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin. That's Colossians 1, verses 13 and 14. Now, as we look at the preeminence of Christ, um, we start looking at some main points that I want to, uh, to emphasize. And in these main points, uh, the main point of uh, Paul's epistle to uh, show how Jesus is superior to all things. He starts off by emphasizing he is the image of the invisible God. You know, Philip wanted to know from John chapter 14 and verses 8 and 9, you know, he said, you know, Philip says, to Jesus, show us the Father. <laughs> and, you know, Jesus came back in verse 9 and said, Philip, I've been with you so long. You say, show us the Father. If you have seen me, what? You've seen the Father. So that prompted me to kind of just look at some of the attributes or characteristics of the Father. What are some things we think of when we think of the Father? I'm doing all the talking. Let me get some people involved. What are some things we think of when we think of God the Father? Michael says he think of the word architect, his will behind the plan. Okay, very good. Anybody else? What do you think of when you think of the Father? What? Okay, we are his children. Okay. Austin shared that with us. Anybody else got any thoughts on what you, I got a whole list of things. I'm trying to pull you into some of them <laughs> before I read my list. Um, but you know what? When you think of the Father, how can you not think of the Father and think of that four letter word, love? That's what John 3.16 is all about, isn't it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So when I think of the Father, I think of love. Some other things that I have on my list, 
when I think of the Father, I think of goodness. You know, going back to Psalm 100. When I think of the Father, I think of forgiveness. I think of grace. I think of compassion. I think of wisdom. I think of power. I think of mercy, holiness, long-suffering, righteousness, impartiality. Now, these, are, these are just a few things. We could go on and on, but um, certainly he is the image of the invisible God. And those are some things that we can certainly, certainly attribute to God the Father. Number two, he is the firstborn of all creation. He is the creator of all things. You'll go back to John chapter 1, starting in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All things were created by him or through him. And without him, nothing was created that was created. So uh, he is the creator of all things. He is before all things. I'll just go ahead and put these up as we look at this. He holds all things together. He is the head of the church. He is the firstborn from the dead. He has the preeminence of all things. He is the fullness of all things. He is the means by which all mankind is reconciled to God. And then he is mankind's hope of glory through redemption. So just a long list of things that emphasize uh, and then, of course, the last one I need to put up is that uh, he holds the key to salvation to all who will obey him. Now, let's look at some key observations for our lesson, okay? We've already talked through some of these. Christ is the head of the body, the church. He is the mystery that has been revealed. Christians, as uh, Christians are complete in Christ. If you're in Christ, you don't need anything else. You know, all you have to do is strive to live for Him and obey Him. And then, as Christians. Let us seek heavenly things where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. So many times we get, allow ourselves to get wrapped up in material things. Um, and it seems that the more we get, the more we want are material things. Of course, there's nothing wrong with having been blessed with material things, but we don't need to allow these things to take out a focus off of God and off of Christ. We need to keep our focus on those heavenly things because these material things, they're going to pass away. They're not going to last forever. Let's see. Another one that we can look at as key observations. Put off the old man. Uh and the old way of living, and put on the new man, a new way of living for Christ as God. Let your speech always be with grace. Season with salt, that you may know how to answer each one. Have you ever wondered why that phrase, season with salt, what does that mean? 
And when you read this in, it, in, in Colossians 4 and verse 6, let your speech always be with grace. Season with salt that you may know how to answer each one. What does that mean, season with salt? Somebody tell me what that means, season with salt. Michael says, you know, in the olden days, what, salt was used mainly, I guess, as a preservative. And uh, so you're saying the way people would accept, as we think of our speech. Consideration, Michael is emphasizing, goes a long way. Anybody else has a comment on season with salt? Ron, you got any thoughts? Right, they were lukewarm, right. 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 So salt, from that standpoint, you're saying is uh, used to what? Influence, preserve. Um, edify maybe would be a word there as well. Thank you, Ron. That's, that's good. Um, right. Okay, very good. Matt, Matt Wallen is emphasizing the way we say things will determine whether people will accept it or not. So some good thoughts there. Appreciate those. Um, I wanted to move on and look at the uh, next one, the character of the new man. And uh, the scripture we have on that is 3, 12 through 17, and I'm just going to emphasize a few of these points. It says, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And then he says in verse 15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are, were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So I read all of that, but basically it's just emphasizing to us a new lifestyle, the character of a, of a Christian, you know, um, to show mercy, to show uh, kindness, um, to show humility. And we, we're in a world today where people don't want to show any kindness. <laughs> I mean, I, had, I was driving back from, uh, had gone to uh, Kennesaw uh, on uh, Saturday, I believe it was. Maybe it was Friday, Friday. 
and was driving back, and I was on Chateau Drive. And, you know, there was a car behind me, and I think he thought that I was going to just cruise on through the stop sign. Well, there's a stop sign. I was going to turn right and come down and get on 101. So, uh, because I stopped, he got angry, pulled around, and the light caught him, so I ended up behind him. <laughs> you know, you hear about road rage all the time in Atlanta. But uh, he was trying to rush me through the stop sign. And we run into situations like that. And I'm just saying that, that we have to just show kindness. Sometimes people will cut you off, you know. But again, kindness is a big thing in the life of a Christian. Let's look at some other. The Christian home. Uh, we have a whole section in here on the Christian home. Uh, Colossians 3, 18, starting in 18 verse 18 all the way to chapter 4 and verse 1, talks about the Christian home. It talks about wives and husbands. Uh, wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things. Uh, talks about bond servants as well. You know, you're working on a job. Do a day's work if you're going to take the job. Don't be the type of person that when the supervisor is present, you'll do all your work, and when the supervisor leaves, uh, you stop working. Don't be that kind of person. And he talks about the, uh, the masters. Give your bond servant what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Just some practical thing, basically telling us also that whatever job you have, you're not just working for that individual. It tells us to do it heartily to the Lord. So those, those are some things that we need to keep in mind. Uh, that scripture, of course, I put it up now. But um, the theme of this lesson as we look at it um, I want to talk a minute about that. The theme kind of emphasized there, and I have that up for you. Cross is preeminent. Nothing can replace or supersede the greatness of the Lord. We need to always remember that. And then another thing. Uh, Anything which attempts to add to the sufficiency of Jesus, whether knowledge or legalism or spiritual experience, is heretical and cannot be from God. You know, you hear people uh, talk about the fact, well, baptism is not essential to salvation. Well, where did they get that from? That's a heresy. That's heretical. Um, you hear people say, well, it's not, it's, we don't have any example to take the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. We don't take, we take it once a year. Well, that's heretical. You know, Acts 20, verse 7 tells us when the disciples came together on the first day of the week. Um, you hear people say, well, I was already saved before I was baptized. Well, that's heretical. Because the Bible says, he that believe and is baptized shall be saved. In that order. <laughs> you have to hear, you have to believe, then you got to be baptized. You're not saved before you're baptized. Now, I'm not going to dwell on that, but just going to emphasize those couple of points. Um, let's go on. The primary task of a Christian is to put on cross and to strive to live lives that are acceptable to him and pleasing to God. This is our primary task. And then we wanted to talk about also in this 
study the importance of knowing doctrine. Is doctrine important? Let's look at a few things. It effectively refutes error. I remember I was at uh, a birthday celebration. The, birth, the person that we were there to celebrate was turning 80 years old. And uh, this brother, we, you know, people just standing around talking, eating barbecue, and, you know, and this brother just out of the blue said, well, you know what the Bible says? He, and then he went on to tell us what the Bible said. And we didn't have a Bible there because we were there to enjoy ourselves. But he said, you know what the Bible says? Uh, and he, he said, uh, he, money is the root of all evil. So I kind of looked at that when he said that. He said, money is the root of all evil. Well, does the Bible say that? <laughs> Probably says a little more than that. So we, everybody just kept eating. And finally said, well, let's, does the Bible say anything about the love of money? You see, he left out one word. The love of money, what the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, I believe verse 10, somewhere in there. But, you know, you're trying to call up a person. You leave out one number, you won't get that person. So it's important to uh, know doctrine. Let's look at another one. It provides true wisdom and knowledge. It builds the road that saints walk on for maturity and growth in Christ Jesus. So, is, is doctrine important? You know, I talked... I, I went back and I looked at that scripture. I'll read it from the Bible. I have it typed out here, but I'll read it from the Bible. Look at 1 Timothy with me. 1 Timothy chapter 4, and the verse is 16. Paul is writing to Timothy there, and he says, Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine of, Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. So is doctrine important? You bet it is. And then he talks about some active workers mentioned in Colossians. Active workers. And let me just get the list up. In Colossians 1, uh, uh, I put Colossians up there because we're, he's writing to these fine Christians. Uh, Epaphras. Paul, and you say, well, why did you put up Paul? Because he includes himself in this study. And let me just go ahead and get some of the other names up. Tychicus. Onesimus, um, we may have to go by, I'm going to get them all up, Aristarchus, Mark is mentioned, Barnabas is mentioned, Jesus called Justus, Nymphus, the church was in his house, uh, now let's go back, I want to go back and uh, go back and talk a minute about Paul, number three. You know, in, in Colossians 1 and verse 23, Paul emphasized that the, church, that the gospel had been preached to every creature on the heaven. Now, you look back and say, well, boy, that's, somebody was doing a lot of preaching. But at that time, the population was not as large as what we have today. Uh, you know, we got missionaries all over the place trying to, in India, in Africa, uh, trying to share the word with folks. Does anybody, just out of the blue, can you tell me what you think the population of the world is today? You know, I looked it up on my, on my 
smartphone, and I looked it up in Google just to get an idea. Now, is Google accurate? I don't know. <laughs> but how many people do you think are in the world today? Just somebody raise your hand and share that with the group. How many do you think? How many billions? <laughs> you guess seven billion? Anybody else wants, wants, wants to guess? <laughs> well, guess what? Uh, you, you're in the ballpark. When you look up the number of people in the world, and according to Google, you get 7.9 billion. So, Michael, you're close. <laughs> you're a little bit over, and, and you're close. 7.9 billion. Well, that's a lot of folks. We've got a tremendous job to take the gospel to all these people. Um, so I'm just emphasizing that the world is different today than it was when Paul was writing this. And uh, when you look at all these people that he talks about, uh, just to give you the information from the text, he says, Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister. And he says, Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. I mean, he just goes on and on. Epaphras, who is one of you, we think he's some, he started the congregation there in Colossae. Um, and he goes on Luke, the beloved physician. We know Luke wrote the book of Acts and the Gospel of Luke, according to Luke. So um, he goes on this long list that I, that I shared with you. But then we ask the question, you know, what are we doing today uh, as far as um, he gives this long list of people who were workers who helped him, you know, in the gospel. And so the question is today, you know, if we would pause and talk about the... Uh, the uh, Act, active walkers. We've talked about those, and in, in, I'm just going to go through the list again to, to make sure I don't skip a slide <laughs> since I've mentioned those to you. Now, this is where I wanted to get. Active walkers of the church at Oak Hill. You, know, you say, well, what is it to do? <laughs> well, we got lost souls. That, that was the purpose of the uh, evangelism workshop that we had. We're still knocking on some doors. We're still going out. We're still, I think Steve told me we had about 50 cards. And he has given. I still have a few that I'm trying to follow up. David and I, David Lofton and I uh, are following up on some of those. And I know some of you have some cards from, from Steve that are left over. But what else do we have going on? We have our, the compassion cards. You know, my, my sister-in-law in Montgomery, my brother, um, many of you sent cards. So I told her, I was talking to her, I said, look, get those cards and put them up on a table <laughs> so he can see them. I was talking just yesterday to Martha Howell, uh, you know, Larry Howell, my, our best friend, past, and we were down there last week, and uh, she was telling me all the cards that she has received from uh, the church here, the church here at Oak Hill. So um, we have many other jobs, you know, we need, uh, we need teachers for the damn junction, and teachers for, uh, you know, other classes that we have here at Oak Hill. Um, so the question is, what are you going to do? Are you going to accept a job, an opportunity to work for the Lord, to knock on doors, to teach a class, uh, to send a card? So many things we can do. And um, so as we think about this in terms of Oak Hill, I want to close today with a poem. And you probably have seen this. 
Uh, but somebody said, that's not my job. Have you heard that? <laughs> that's somebody else's job. Let that person do it. Well, I got a poem for you. And we, we'll get out early because this is all that I have. This is the poem. This is a story about four people named everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. There was an important job to be done, and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it. But nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody should have done. What about that? Just something for us to think about. When we look at jobs <laughs> to be done, we can always so that's not my job. But we always need to realize we're working for the Lord. And the Bible tells us, you know, when you work for the Lord, God will honor those who work for the Lord. And we need to be about doing those things that will please Him, please God. So those are my thoughts today that I pull from the um, epistle on uh, Colossians, and uh, we'll close with prayer, and you'll have about five minutes to fellowship.